Hey everyone, and welcome. I'm Mystic, one of Europe's top-rated rep paladins, and currently the highest-rated paladin in the world. In this guide, I'll be going over your best comps, talents, traits, and gear before breaking down what your playstyle looks like when playing Arena. Starting with your comps, Red Paladins have access to a handful of strong ones in PHP and several other Ret Resto Shaman comps. Each of these comps play out in a very similar way, with your goal to set up huge bursts with Avenging Wrath or Hammer of Reckoning while CCing your kill target and the healer. Your easiest and most straightforward comp, PHP, has been a staple of Ret Paladins for many years. PHP's main strengths are lots of CC for healers with stun, trap, and fear, great sustained damage from the survival hunter and disc priest, and huge burst potential with ret cooldowns and dark archangel. PHP aims to set up kill windows by throwing tons of CC on the healer while using offensive cooldowns and dealing high sustained damage in between your goes to keep the opposing team defensive. Another great comp that sees play over 3k is ret warrior shaman. Its main strengths are high pressure with damage from the ret and warrior combined with a mortal strike effect and purges from the shaman, and capable of rushing down disc priest which are the most popular healer right now. Another great comp is Ret Shadow Priest Shaman, which takes advantage of the powerful Shadow Priest Arresto Shaman combination while abusing the Ret's ability to one shot. Its main strengths are easy to set up kills with instant range CC from the Shadow Priest, and it's extremely durable with lots of cooldowns to cycle through and the ability to remove CC from our healer. Outside of the comps I just mentioned, which are all capable of seeing play well above 3000 rating, a few other comps you might want to try out are Ret Boomkin Shaman and Ret Mage Healer, with both Fire and Frost working along with either a Disc Priest or a Resto Shaman. Ret Sub Rogue Disc is also somewhat decent, and even Double Ret Disc can work, as you're capable of dealing crazy burst as seen here. As for your talents, your default build should look like this, with the last PvP talent being dependent on your comp and the matchup. When playing PHP and Ret Warrior Shaman, you'll usually want to take Jurisdiction as your last talent, and when playing most other Ret comps, you can take either Law and Order or Lawbringer. I personally prefer to take Law and Order as my third talent when playing Ret Shadow Priest Shaman. As for potential talent swaps, you can consider swapping out Unbreakable Spirit for Eye for an Eye when playing against comps like Turbo and Jungle. You may also want to spec into Hammer of Wrath instead of Blade of Wrath for a little more ranged damage during your kill windows. However, I prefer to keep Blade of Wrath for more holy power generation throughout the game and whenever I'm specced into Law and Order. Next, let's go over your best traits. This one's pretty simple. You want to stack triple Avenger's Might. No other trait even comes close to Avenger's Might, and it's not even worth taking any defensive traits over Avenger's Might. The helmet, Sea Brawler's Great Helm, drops from the last boss of Freehold, so get a group of plate users together to help you get this helm. The shoulders, Kraken Shell Pauldrons, drop from the last boss of Siege of Boralus, so again, get that group of plate users together. You can also get Avenger's Might by capping your conquest as it's on the Dread Gladiator's Plate Pauldrons. As for the chest, well, it's a little more tricky. You can get it in one of three ways. The first is to check both Zuldazar and Drostvar to see if there's a daily quest awarding either Bleakwield Chest Guard or Breastplate of Reason's Blade Guard. The second is to check if there are any quests in either of those zones rewarding an Azerite Cache, which will have a 1 in 3 chance of containing the chest. And the third is to complete the Zuldazar for Horde or Drostvar for Alliance Emissary while they reward an Azerite Cache, again for a 1 in 3 chance of containing the chest. Note that the Emissary is the only way to get the chest above 330 item level. And before you ask, yes, you should use the blue chest even if it's just 330 item level with Avenger's Might. Finally, let's talk about gear. Ret is one of the specs where your best stats in PvE are not exactly the same in PvP. This is because your playstyle revolves around setting up huge one-shots, and so you need your stats to mirror these goals. To that end, mastery is key. Enchant mastery, gem mastery, stack mastery. On my main, I currently have 35% mastery and still want more. Beyond mastery, you'll want to get a decent amount of crit to increase the odds that you actually win games in your kill windows. I personally have 19% crit, but you could probably get away with having a little less. After you have a decent amount of crit, the rest of your stats come down to personal preference. I prefer to get as much haste as possible, with my main currently sitting on 12% haste, which I do feel is a little low. Haste shortens your globals and overall makes your gameplay much more fluid. It's also technically the stat that gives you the highest DPS. This leaves the versatility as a stat that I value the least, despite it giving a flat increase to damage and healing, I feel that it does not come close in value to what any of the other stats provide. To conclude, I believe our stat priority for PvP should be Mastery, Crit to 15-20%, to Haste, Versatility. 
before we move on, the only thing left to discuss are trinkets, and this is an interesting one. Without a doubt, you'll want to get your hands on a strength on use trinket. I personally use the Dread Gladiator's badge on my main at 385 item level, which provides me with a 1746 strength on use, but anything that provides a similar strength on use will suffice. As for your second trinket, I've tested many different options, including a second on use and trinkets with passive strength and damage, but nothing has come close to the strength of using a proc trinket. Having a proc trinket will allow you to deal huge burst if it procs while you have your on use up, and it can also be up during other kill windows. As for which proc trinket you should use, well, you have two options. Personally, I've found that a blue 330 item level trinket from a world quest in Zandalar has hands down given me the best results. Note that this trinket can titan forge to around 370 item level. The gilded lower figurine at 330 item level gives me a 1129 strength proc, which is completely absurd and lets you deal crazy burst. It has a great proc rate, and I recommend setting up a weak aura to track when it's up and try to set up your burst windows around it. This clip is a great example as my trinket procs and I urge my hunter to CC the shaman as quickly as possible before the proc expires. We get the CC and I do a 57k execution sentence on the demon hunter resulting in the kill. A great alternative is to simply use a dread gladiator's insignia, which provides half the strength on the proc but lasts for double the duration, meaning it's easier to line up with your burst. Alright, that about wraps up this section on your best comps, talents, traits and gear. Next we'll be looking at your playstyle in Arena by covering each of your most important goals and how to accomplish them. So, what are your most important goals? Well, as a Red Paladin in BFA, your number one goal is to consistently set up kill attempts with cross CC and huge burst while making sure to do so on the right target. On top of setting up kills, you also need to know when you should go all in. This usually depends on the comp that you're playing with comps like PHP favoring an all in strategy, whereas comps like Red Shadow Priest Shaman benefit from a more defensive playstyle. However, the matchup can also dictate this. Finally, you'll want to make sure you optimize the use of all of your defensive cooldowns by using them in the right way at the right time. Alright, so let's get into some gameplay where I'll break down each of these goals one by one so that hopefully you can do exactly what I do when playing Arena. Starting with your first goal, how can you consistently set up effective kill attempts? Well, there's a lot to this one, so let's get into it. First and foremost, let's get the damage part of this down. In order to effectively burst, you need to have a few abilities ready. These are Execution Sentence, Wake of Ashes, and either Avenging Wrath or Hammer of Reckoning. Beyond that, you'll want to have Inquisition up, Judgment on your target, and 3 or more Holy Power. Whenever you're in this state, it means you've got all of your damage lined up and you're ready to go. The only thing that's left to do is execute some cross CC with your team so that the opposing team can't avoid your damage. This means you'll also want your Hammer of Justice ready. Let's take a look at this clip, where me and my team set up a kill on the Demon Hunter. We cross CC them with my stun on the Demon Hunter and my Shadow Priest's Psychic Horror on the Resto Shaman. Let's take a look at that checklist I mentioned earlier. Execution Sentence, Wake of Ashes and Hammer of Reckoning are all ready. I've got Inquisition up, my Judgment on the Demon Hunter, and I've got 5 Holy Power. This means I'm ready to burst. On top of all of that, I've even got the proc from my Gilded Lower Figurine to add to my burst. I use my Hammer of Reckoning and follow it up with Execution Sentence, Wake of Ashes, and the Templar's Verdict to finish off the Demon Hunter. Now, let's go back to just before the kill. I'd like you to take a moment to look at what's going on and try to figure out why this kill attempt resulted in us winning the game. Well, both the Demon Hunter and the Resto Shaman don't have a trinket ready. These were forced in previous kill attempts. This brings me on to my next point of how you can set up the eventual kill by cycling through enemy cooldowns. This is why it's important to consistently set up kills properly in order to eventually get to the point where they run out of cooldowns and can't survive another burst window. Let's take this PHP game against Rogue Mage Paladin as an example. In order for us to set up our one-shot, we need to get the Rogue to Trinket and the Paladin to both Trinket and use his Divine Shield. This means at best, we can win this matchup in as little as 4 kill attempts. So, starting with our first kill attempt, we trap the Paladin and stun the Rogue at the same time, resulting in the rogue using his trinket, cloak, and eventually vanish to escape. We now have 2 minutes to get through the rest of the paladin's cooldowns in order to win the game before the rogue gets his trinket back. For our second kill attempt, I stun the paladin into a full trap and my hunter stuns the rogue. This forces the paladin to use his trinket and blessing of sacrifice. Our third kill attempt once again sees me stun the rogue and my hunter trap the paladin which forces divine shield and a second blessing of sacrifice. 
This now leaves the opposing team with no more outs, and we've got 45 seconds to set up one more kill before the rogue gets his trinket back. And finally, with around 15 seconds left on the rogue's trinket, we trap the paladin and stun the rogue to secure the win. Note that although we managed to win this game in under 2 minutes by setting up 4 kill attempts, your games won't always look like this, especially at higher MMR, when teams attempt to counter your kill attempts with the preemptive use of defensive cooldowns. With that being said, even if teams get defensive cooldowns off, you have the potential to kill through them as a rep paladin. Take this clip for example, where I'm playing against a Frost Mage, Balanced Druid, and Resto Shaman. We've already gone through both of the mage's ice blocks and he doesn't have a trinket. I get everything to line up, including my on-use trinket and proc trinket, and actually end up killing the mage through the Resto Shaman's Spirit Link totem. Next we're going to look at the concept of going all in, which basically means for your team to commit offensive cooldowns, defensive cooldowns, and even getting your healer to assist with offensive dispels and damage while running at your kill target. This is a very common strategy when playing PHP, but can even come into play in other matchups when playing more defensive rat comps. Take this clip of PHP vs RMP for example. After forcing the mage to ice block, we decide to all in for the kill. Where I would normally save my trinket for defensive purposes, I decide to trinket out of the kidney shot and commit to killing the mage before he can use his second ice block. Here's another example, this time in what would be considered a more defensive comp in Red Shadow Priest Shaman. Because we're facing a Resto Druid, we have the option of going all in with purges if we're able to gather a ton of momentum after forcing defensive cooldowns. Because we've already forced both the Shaman and Druid's trinkets here, the threat of our upcoming kill attempt, which is now ready, forces the Druid to use a preemptive Iron Block in the hopes that it'll get it off as we land our CC. Instead, we delay our kill attempt until just after the Iron Block fades. Let's once again look at that checklist from earlier. Again, Execution Sentence, Wake of Ashes, and Hammer of Reckoning are all ready. I've also got Inquisition up, my Judgment on the Shaman, and I've got 3 Holy Power. This means I've checked every box and I'm ready to go. I execute my burst and get the Shaman to 6%, but he manages to survive. It's at this point that we decide to all in. We have our Resto Shaman spam Purge while we chase the Shaman and deal as much damage as possible to try and score a kill. I even follow up my Hammer of Reckoning with my Avenging Wrath, despite not having any form of crowd control, just because we're going all in for the kill. I then trinket the first CC that lands on me, and use my Shield of Vengeance for the added damage when it expires. Eventually, I get the druid into a full stun and we're able to score a kill despite him getting his iron block back. In this example, if any more crowd control would have been used on me, I would have even used my divine shield offensively. And speaking of using divine shield offensively, here's a perfect example of knowing when to bubble for the kill. I'm playing PHP against warrior, demon hunter, resto shaman. Both the demon hunter and resto shaman have used their trinkets from previous kill attempts, this means if we line it up perfectly, there's no way they can survive our next kill attempt. While chasing the demon hunter to set up the kill, he preemptively uses his blur. So, we decide to wait it out and go for our CC once the blur fades. Just as it's about to fade, we decide to go for our CC, with my hunter trapping the shaman. However, the demon hunter uses his imprison on me to stop me from stunning him. I respond to this by using my divine shield and landing my stun on the demon hunter. One more look at that checklist sees that I'm ready to burst with execution sentence, Wake of Ashes, and Hammer of Reckoning all being ready, while Inquisition is up, Judgment is on the Demon Hunter, and I've got 5 Holy Power. I execute my burst with my Priest also using Dark Archangel, which pretty much guarantees this kill. The Warrior even comes to peel, but because I've got Divine Shield up, his fear is immune on me and we score the kill. Another great example of knowing when to all in can commonly happen against Holy Paladins. Take this example of PHP against FLP, where we force the Paladin to Trinket with our first CC chain. We then pull back and play defensive, which gives us an opportunity to swap onto the Paladin with a stun as he decides to push in. This results in us forcing his Divine Shield. Now that we know the Paladin has no cooldowns left to keep himself alive, we decide to all in for a kill on him, chasing him across the map and eventually getting him into a full stun and killing him.
Finally, we'll be looking at how you can optimize the use of your defensive cooldowns. Your major cooldowns are Shield of Vengeance, Blessing of Sanctuary, Blessing of Protection, and Divine Shield. The good thing about these cooldowns is they should pretty much all be used in a reactive fashion. This means you never really need to preemptively use your defensive cooldowns, and can instead just react to what the opposing team is doing. This makes Rhett easier to play than some other classes, which sometimes need to use defensive cooldowns before being stunned or taking damage. Let's go through each of these cooldowns one by one, and look at clips which demonstrate a good use of them. Starting with Shield of Vengeance, this is typically a cooldown that you want to use when you drop low as a way to hold onto your Divine Shield and give your healer some breathing room to keep you alive. One of the best times to use Shield of Vengeance is when you drop low and you're coming out of a stun while your healer is in crowd control. This will give you some time to potentially get some heals off or even allow for your teammate to help heal for you until your healer can come out of crowd control and save you. This of course also means that you should not waste your Shield of Vengeance when you don't need to. Take this clip against RMP as an example. As I come out of Kidney Shot, this time my Shaman has an Earthen Shield Totem down on top of me, and he's about to come out of CC. I take advantage of this fact and I don't waste my Shield of Vengeance, despite being at 50% health. When facing teams that mostly deal a ton of consistent pressure, you shouldn't be afraid to use your Shield of Vengeance whenever your healer gets CC'd. Here I'm facing a Jungle Cleave, a comp that has huge sustained damage. As soon as they land their first trap on my Priest, I trade my Shield of Vengeance, despite the Feral not having used his offensive cooldowns. This ends up being an excellent use of my Absorb, as shortly afterwards I drop to 2%, but my Priest is able to keep me alive without me having to use any more cooldowns. Before we move on to the next ability, I'd like to showcase an offensive use of Shield of Vengeance. Although it should primarily be used as a defensive ability, you have the option of using it shortly before going for a kill, as seen in this clip where my Shield of Vengeance explodes for 22k damage, followed up by a 68k execution sentence which kills the Hunter without any crowd control. Moving on, let's look at Blessing of Sanctuary, a PvP talent on a 45 second cooldown that allows you to remove a stun, fear or silence from a teammate. The most common way you'll use this ability is to simply get your healer out of a stun. It's important to react quickly, otherwise you risk your healer taking too much damage or tanking follow up CC. In this example here, the Holy Paladin has just put my healer into a full hammer of justice. If I don't quickly react and get my healer out of the stun with Sank, the Paladin will be able to follow it up with a full repentance. So, I make sure to quickly dispel the stun, which allows my healer to line of sight the Repentance. This time, my healer gets put into a full kidney shot, which the mage wants to polymorph him out of. I make the mistake of being step kicked by the rogue, which delays my blessing of sanctuary as I'm locked out. But luckily, I get it off in time to help my shaman avoid the incoming polymorph. Something to learn from this clip is to avoid getting interrupted at vital times like this, as it could easily have resulted in my shaman being polymorphed. Even if there is no risk of follow-up CC, you'll still want to sank your healer out of important CC when your team is under pressure. Here, the turbo has a ton of pressure on my priest, so I make sure to instantly sank my shaman out of the warrior's fear. On top of avoiding incoming CC or just generally sanking when your team is under pressure, you'll also need to quickly sank stuns against demon hunters so that your healer can avoid the mana rift. In these two examples, I make sure to immediately sank my healer out of the demon hunter stun so they can avoid losing mana from the demon hunter's mana rift. The common theme in all of the clips I just showed you is that I was not cross CC'd myself, which meant I was able to freely dispel my healer. But what about when you have to deal with being cross CC'd? Well, generally there are one of two ways of dealing with this. The first is that you simply trinket out of whatever CC you're in if it's extremely important for you to get the dispel off. The second is that you may actually have a very small window to get your dispel off before you're cross CC'd. This can be a very common occurrence, especially against rogues that stun your healer first before stunning you. Let's start by looking at when you might want to trinket out of crowd control to sank your healer. In this PHP vs jungle game, I get stunned by the hunter while the feral moves over to stun my priest. Instead of just sitting in the stun and letting my healer get bashed into a full trap, I immediately trinket out of the intimidation stun and get my healer out of the bash as soon as he gets stunned, which allows us to delay their pressure and get hours going first, something that's incredibly important in this matchup as you can win if you quickly build momentum. In this example, the hunter has his trap ready when me and my shaman get stunned. 
I trinket and sank my healer while the hunter throws his freezing trap, which allows my shaman to avoid the trap. In general, when you're cross CC'd against a hunter team while their trap is ready, it's great to trinket and sank your healer out of CC if the hunter is not on top of them. This will allow your healer to have some room to avoid the trap with their abilities like Grounding Totem and Premonition. Against Rogue Mage, it can also be good to trinket out of CC to sank your healer so that they can avoid incoming polymorphs. However, you need to be careful when doing so. Take this example where I do a very bad trinket sank as the mage is already casting polymorph, but I wait for the kidney to be used on me before using trinket and sank. This results in me totally wasting my sank as my healer gets full polymorphed as I remove the stun, so be careful when doing this. Now, let's take a look at a few examples where you need to react quickly before your cross seed in order to sank your healer. Here we see a very common scenario against Rogue Mage when playing with a Resto Shaman. In order to prevent my Shaman from using Earthen Shield Totem, they need to start their CC by CCing my Shaman. However, this gives me a second to react and use a Blessing of Sanctuary on my Shaman before I'm cross CC'd with a Garrote. This gives my Shaman time to avoid the Polymorph and eventually use his Earthen Shield Totem on me to completely negate their kill attempt. Again, we see a Rogue stunning my Shaman before CCing me, but because I'm able to quickly react, I dispel my Shaman before I get stunned, which allows him to use an Earthen Shield Totem on me and forces them to open on my Shadow Priest instead. This time, we're a bit later in a game against a Rogue Mage, but the exact same scenario plays out. The Rogue cheap shots my Shaman first, and I'm able to sank my healer out of the stun just before I'm put into a Kidney Shot. This then allows my healer to wind shear the incoming polymorph and avoid being crowd controlled, resulting in me being fine. This also applies to when two different players initiate the CC, where they will often leave a small gap if they don't time it perfectly. Here we see my shaman get put into a full fear, and because I react quickly, I'm able to use Blessing of Sanctuary to remove the fear before the rogue erodes me. You'll find yourself in these sorts of situations very often, so it's extremely important that you learn to react quickly to CC on your healer in order to get them out before your cross CC'd. Before we move on, I'd like to show you an alternative use of Blessing of Sanctuary, which is to use it on your DPS partner. Although this doesn't come into play too often, I'd say maybe 1 out of 50 Sanks could be used on your DPS partner, when you do it at the right time, it can be an excellent play. Take this clip as an example, where I'm playing Red Shadow Priest Shaman against our Impala. They've set up a kill on my Priest with a Polymorph on my healer and a Kidney Shot on my Shadow Priest. By dispelling my priest down here, it allows him to land the triple fear and gives us enough time to stabilize without having to commit any additional cooldowns. Another example of when you may want to do this is when playing with a hunter, if they're about to die in a stun while your healer is in CC, you can dispel your hunter so that they can use defensive cooldowns like their heal or turtle. Next, let's talk about Blessing of Protection, a magical buff that makes whoever you cast it on immune to all physical attacks for 10 seconds. It also applies forbearance for 30 seconds, which prevents the use of Divine Shield while it's up, so be careful when using it on yourself. Blessing of Protection, otherwise known as BOP, is extremely powerful against comps that primarily deal physical damage, such as Jungle Cleave. However, it can be offensively dispelled, which means you have to be careful about how and when you use it. Take this clip of PHP vs Jungle Cleave as an example. My healer has been put into a full trap and the Feral has used his Incarnation. Because I'm already positioned near a pillar, I'm able to use my Blessing of Protection while lining the Disc Priest, which prevents him from dispelling my bop. And when he goes for the Master Spell, my Hunter is there to interrupt him, resulting in us completely countering their trap and incarnation with just my bop, allowing me to hold onto my Divine Shield. If you're facing a physical damage dealer paired up with a class that deals magical damage, you can still use Blessing of Protection to survive, providing you're able to line of sight the magical damage dealer. For example here, I use Blessing of Protection on myself to immune all of the Feral's damage and keep myself alive while my healer is CC'd. I just make sure to also line of sight the Destruction Warlock to avoid dying. On top of using it to immune physical attacks, it can also be used to remove physical debuffs. A great example of this is an Assassination Rogue's Vendetta. Although you normally use BOP on the physical crowd control, Blind, against Rogues, there may be times where it's better to BOP the Vendetta. For example here, my Shaman is able to get an Earthen Shield Totem down just before the Rogue blinds him so we decide not to bop the blind. As Earthen Shield Totem is ending, the rogue decides to use his vendetta on me. I respond to this by using my Blessing of Protection to ensure my safety so that I can start to play aggressive. Now, as I just mentioned, Blessing of Protection can be used to remove physical crowd control from your teammates. The most common use of this is to remove a rogue's blind on your healer. If you're given a gap, you should always try to be ready to bop the blind before the rogue cross CCs you. As seen here, where the rogue blinds my healer, and because I'm fast, 
I'm able to use the bop on the blind just before I get kidneyed, which completely counters their kill attempt. Note that my trinket wasn't even ready here, which means I wouldn't have been able to bop the blind if I wasn't fast. However, no matter how fast you are, you won't be able to bop the blind if they CC you first. For example in this clip, the rogue cheap shots me first and then blinds my healer. So I trinket and instantly bop my healer out of the blind. For this reason, it's usually good to save your trinket for using bop on the first blind against rogues. Against caustic leaves, you're usually free to bop any sort of random physical CC they have, such as a druid's bash, monk's incap, or even a panda's racial, as seen here, where I decide to bop my healer out of the incap while I'm low, so he can earthen shield totem and easily keep me alive. Also note that you can bop yourself offensively to remove physical stuns from yourself, as seen here in a PHP mirror, where I bop the hunter stun on myself and go for a kill on the enemy ret. Just remember that when you bop yourself, you can't bubble for another 30 seconds, so be careful when you do this. It can also be used offensively to avoid interrupts. Here I make a swap onto the Holy Paladin and use bop on my Shadow Priest so he can avoid the Warrior's interrupt and master spell the Divine Shield. I'm then able to kick the end of the cost and we score a kill. The final defensive cooldown to discuss is Divine Shield. As a general rule of thumb, you and your team should try to trade as many other defensive cooldowns as possible before using your Divine Shield. Here I'm playing a PHP mirror and start to drop really low while my healer is in CC. We call out that we'll be using Dome that's been talented to increase his damage reduction, and so even though I drop low, I know the moment my healer comes out of CC, I'll be safe, so I hold onto my Divine Shield and let my healer save me. This time I'm playing Red Shadow Priest Shaman against RMP. Again, we see me drop really low, but instead of using Divine Shield, we have my Shaman use his Spiritling Totem to keep me alive. When you do decide to use your Divine Shield, the only thing to be careful with is when playing against priests that are able to master spell it. Your counterplay to this is to try and Divine Shield on relatively high health against Disc Priests. Just be absolutely sure that you would have dropped load and died if you didn't Divine Shield on high health. Take this example against Jungle Cleave, where my healer is put into a full trap and I'm stunned with no way to break out and heal myself. We decide to trade my Divine Shield early, and I move away to avoid the Master Spell. This guarantees my safety and allows me to immediately start playing offensive. Alternatively, you can try to stop the Priest from Master Spelling by either CCing or interrupting them. Here I decide to Divine Shield as my healer is stuck in CC and the row commits his Vendetta. I bubble before I drop too low and run over to stun the Priest, which stops him from Master Spelling and actually wins us the game. Also, if the Disc Priest has no mana, they won't be able to Master Spell. Here we see me get garroted and my Priest and Shaman both get stunned, which means they can't use Life Swap or Spirit Link Totem. So, I use my Divine Shield, as it's the only way for me to survive. And, because the Priest's mana is low, he can't Master Spell me. Okay everyone, that about wraps up this Ret playstyle guide. I hope you enjoy this one and will be able to apply most of what you learned into your own gameplay. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.